All right, good morning. Yes, we are continuing on in the book of Job. And today we're going to go through like chapters 19 through 34, I think it is, or maybe even 37. And again, we're just going to go through uh, certain, certain parts of it because obviously we're not going verse by verse and ch chapter by chap chapter by chapter and verse by verse, but we're looking at some of the highlights through it here. And we're going to tell you a little bit about it here, okay? So. Let's pick us up in Job 19, and we're going to look at Job 19, 23 to 26. Job is lamenting here, and uh, let's see, here it comes. Yeah, 19 through 37, and okay, he responds again. Job keeps responding. Uh, the, the, uh, his three friends keep accusing him of having some secret sin, and Job keeps responding and saying, no, I don't have a secret sin. God's just not being fair with me. And we're, we're going to find out, you know, certainly God is fair. God's fair with everybody. God's good. Amen. So let's look at here. Uh, Job here says, oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. Well, they are. <laughs> he didn't know this at the time, but that's true. He says, with an iron stylus and lead, they were engraved in the rock forever. Well, what did Jesus say? One little tittle and iota of the law will not be lost. The book, you know, the word of the Lord will endure forever, right? And so Job's words will be inscribed forever, whether they're in, you know, paper pages and book or on tablets or even in our hearts. God said his word will be forever. And here Job is getting his wish here, all right? And the way he speaks about God and how he's being treated unfairly Maybe he doesn't really want his words to be going on forever, but, but they are, and they're a good lesson for us. In verse 25, as for me, I love this verse, I know that my Redeemer lives, and at last he will take his stand on the earth. Job is being very prophetic here. He says, you know, right now God is living, but guess what? Later on, he is going to be on the earth. And what do we know? Jesus is coming back again someday, amen? Amen. So, and, lo and look at this, even verse 26, even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh, I shall see God. Job has somehow got insight to the afterlife. He knows he's going to be with his Lord and Savior forever. He's not understanding why he's being treated the way he is. He's lost his family. He's lost his wealth. Uh, he's on the point of death with, uh, with the sickness that Satan has caused on him. Yet, even after all that, he knows he's going to see God. Now, we're going to find out that Job is going to start lamenting and wondering why God is treating him this way. But at this point, right here, Job is not accusing God. He never does accuse God. He never curses God. He questions him all through it. And he wonders why God is doing what he's doing to him. But we see here... He believes that someday he's going to see God and be with him forever, even after his bones and his skin is destroyed. That's a great hope we all have, amen, for knowing who our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is. And so Job is looking, I believe, to the future and, and seeing a, a Redeemer. And he knows that redemption is only in God alone, not in some kind of man coming, you know, I mean, just a man. Of course, Jesus was man and God, but I'm, I'm talking about just a man. All right. So now we're going to jump to verse, uh, chapter 23, actually. And we see Job is going to start longing for God here. And let's pick it up in, I think it's verse 2 is that I have up there. Yeah, 2 through 7. Even today, my complaint is rebellion. His hand is heavy despite my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come to a seat. I would present my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would learn the words which he would answer and perceive what he would say to me. Would he contend with me by the greatness of his power? No, surely he would pay attention to me. There the upright would reason with him and I would be delivered forever from my judge. Guys, okay, Job here says he wants to be in the presence of God because he wants to defend himself. Wow. Okay, I think he's got it wrong. I'm sure he's got it wrong here. 
Can we get into the presence of God and defend ourselves for our lives? No. There was a, there was a movie years ago called Defending Your Life, and it was about somebody who went to heaven and basically had to defend what they did in life to God. And, uh, but you know what? We're, we're not going to be able to defend ourselves. The only thing we can do is plead guilty before God and plead the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? And that's... Job doesn't see this yet, but he thinks... He thinks that if he got in front of God, oh boy, he's going he's gonna to just tell God, he's going to let him have it and say, hey, why did you do this to me? You know I've been righteous, I've been upright, I've done this. And he thinks that's going to happen. Look at what he says here in verse 4. It says right here, I would present my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we know that the law, the Ten Commandments, is designed not to be able to say, hey, look, we followed all these commandments, now let us in, God. You know, let us into your heaven. No. The law is designed to do what? To shut us up in front of a holy God, right? We look at the law and go, oh, we broke that, we broke that, we broke, oh, you know. And Jesus went even further than that. He said, you know, uh, it says, you know, you shall not commit adultery. I tell you, if you've looked at a woman with lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery in your heart, right? Do not murder he says, if you've looked at your fellow man in anger, you've committed murder in your heart. So we've all fallen short of the glory of God. And Job doesn't realize this. The problem is that Job is comparing himself, not with God, but with who? Other people, right? And that's what we tend to do as humans. We go, you know, we're, we're not so bad. You know, it reminds me of the guy that was a really stinker when he was on earth, right? He was a bad guy, just a, a horrible person. And he passes away. Well, his brother comes up to him, and he said, uh, up to the priest there who's going to be doing the, the, the funeral, and he says, hey, father, uh, I'm going to give you $50,000 if you say that my brother was a saint in front of everybody at the funeral. He says, well, I can't do that. He was a bad guy, man. He never came to church. He, he never, you know, forget it. I can't. He says, okay, make it 100000 And so he's kind of thinking about it. He goes, hmm, 100000 Well, we could use that money for good. Okay, I'll do that. And so at the funeral, he gets up there and he says, you know, at a funeral, you're supposed to say nice things about the deceased, but the man who is laying here was a really bad guy. We know that he lied to people. He was a crooked politician. He was full of graft. He committed uh, terrible sins. But compared to his brother, <laughs> he was a saint. Okay, so <laughs> that's how he told him. So that's, that's the problem is we try to compare ourselves to other people, right? And Job is falling into the same trap here. Job says if he could just plead his case before God, he would be found innocent. Well, we know nobody is innocent before God, but Job doesn't have this knowledge, right? All right, let's uh, now jump to uh, chapter 24. And in, in chapter 24, Job says, God seems to ignore the wrongs in the world. All right, uh, and in 25 then... Bildad comes up, and again, when, I'm not going to read all through chapter 24, but basically, Job is saying that, you know, there's, there's evil going on, and God's just, God's just turning a blind eye to it. Why is he turning a blind eye to me? I don't, I don't get it, but there's evil going on, and God does that, and he shouldn't do that, is what Job is saying. But in, verse, in chapter 25, though, Bildad comes forward, and this is like the first time Bildad ever says anything good. All right, he's one of the three friends that Job has, and and I actually put all six verses here because fortunately at this point, Bildad doesn't have a lot to say. All right, usually they've all been winded, you know, but Bildad only says a few things here. So I have all of verse 20, or chapter twenty-five here, and Bildad basically says that man doesn't measure up to God. And let's read it together, or look at it together here. He says, "Then Bildad the she the Shuhite answered." Dominion and awe belong to him who establishes peace in his heights. Is there any number of his troops, and upon whom does his light not rise? How then can a man be just with God, or how can he be clean who is born of woman? Even the moon has no brightness, and the stars are not pure in his sight. 
how much less man that maggot and the son of man that worm. Now, I'm going to do this more next week, but I want you to see some of the hidden science in the Bible here. What did Bildad say? He says on verse 5, he says, even the moon has no brightness. Back then, people didn't know that the sun was reflecting, the moon was reflecting the sun, and that's how we saw it. They thought the moon was one of the things in the sky that gave off light. How did Bildad know this? I think God gave him knowledge to understand that. I don't think, you know, he didn't have a telescope out there. He didn't see that the sun was bouncing the light off the moon and they saw the reflection of the, of the sun in the moon. No. But look at that. Verse 5, he says, even before, even before you know, you know that, was, that we know the telescopes were made or, or astronomy was even a real thing, Bildad knew that the moon was not bright. I, I don't know about you, I think it's pretty remarkable. <laughs> Right? God, now I'm not saying that the Bible is a science book. The Bible teaches us, you know, the relationship between man and God, and man and man, and, uh, and how we need to get, get back to God. It's a redemption story. And it's a history story. It shows the history of, of Israel and, you know, and, and Jesus coming to earth and his, uh, his testament, the, the people's testament of seeing Jesus, right? But there is some hidden science in the Bible. And I think if God is going to put something in that we can show scientifically now is true, I think God should get a science right, don't you? And he does here. The moon has no brightness. Again, how would you know that back then? You wouldn't unless you had some knowledge from God that was given that to you. As a matter of fact, not only did they not think that the moon wasn't, you know, just a, a ball of dirt or whatever that didn't have its own light, most religions believe the moon was what? A god or a goddess, right? And so here he is saying that the moon is no brightness and it's created by God. He says, and the stars are not pure in his sight. How much less that maggot and the son of man that worm. God is brighter than the stars, he got that right, too. And he says, you know, don't even try to measure up to God. Bildad, Bildad finally gets the question right. He says, you know, we, we can't get close to God on our own. We can only do it when God decides to give us that righteousness, and he does that through his son, Jesus Christ, right? We take it in faith. We realize what Jesus did for us, and we say, hey, listen, I, I plead the blood of Christ that's my righteousness, not what I can do. Well, Job believes that he is righteous and he's comparing himself to other people. And finally, Bildad gets it right and says that, you know, no. Well, let's pick, pick it up now in, in Job 26. And I only have one verse for you here, and I think this is really great here. Again, 26.7 in the New American Standard Bible, Job uh, rebukes Bildad at the beginning of this chapter. But in 26.7, Job, Job says, he stretches out the north over empty space and hangs the earth on nothing. Now, guys, I'm not saying that space is nothing. Space is something. But to everybody else, I mean, it looks like nothing, right? But it's something that God created. It's not like, you know, the world is on a string, going around the sun, and there's something holding on the east end of the string. Now, this, again, is remarkable. Years ago, what did people think kept the earth going? Well, if you look at all the other mythologies, uh, I'll look at Greek mythology. Who held up the earth in Greek mythology? Atlas, right? Atlas held up the earth. In some of the other mythologies, the earth is on the back of a turtle. That's a pretty big turtle, if you ask me, but okay. <laughs> And why a turtle? Why would they think a turtle? Well, because they can't com comprehend that it's just out there. We know it's gravitation now, right? Uh, but God set those laws of gravitation in motion. However, to our eye here, it seems like the earth is just hung on nothing. 
And again, God gets the science right. Job has insight here and he says, the earth hangs on nothing. Again, how would he know this unless God had inspired him to tell him to tell this? Because science at the time, if there was, you know, whatever science there was, it was more mythology is that the earth was on the back of some kind of creature or being held up by some giant god like Atlas. I, again, it's just amazing to me some of the science we see in, in Job. And we're going to do more of that next week because when God answers Job, there's a, there's a lot more we'll talk about next week. But let's continue on here. Let's look at Job 27 to 28 now. And in 27 to 28, I've got a few verses here for you, but I'm going to tell you what's going on here uh, if you don't remember. Job comes back and he asserts his righteousness and he talks about the earth's treasures and the search for wisdom. In, verse, in, in chapter 27, he talks about how, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, in, I'm sorry, chap, chapter 28, he talks about how there are precious metals and they're hidden in the earth and then earthquakes come and they bring them to the surface of the earth and, and man can find it. And then he compares that to wisdom and he says that wisdom is harder to find than that. You can only get wisdom from one source. You're not going to get wisdom from inanimate objects. You know, gold isn't going to give you wisdom. Pearls aren't going to give you wisdom. Uh, the only thing that give you wisdom is somebody who's wise. And that's not other people. It's who? It's God, right? And I think that's amazing in, my, in itself is that atheists today and people that believe that there is no no other world outside of our physical world. In other words, they, they believe that if it's only physical, that's all that exists. Nothing else exists outside of it. So they believe that our brain processes is the process of basically just chemicals, and that's how we think. Okay, then everything's preordained then. Because if you follow the laws of chemistry, everything has to happen in a certain order or the law is broken, and they, they don't believe the laws of nature or the laws of physics and the laws of chemistry, chemistry break. But God, when we believe in God, when we believe something outside of the physical realm, we believe that we have a mind, not just a body, a mind that allows us to reason, right? And because we can reason, we can get wisdom. And where do we get wisdom ultimately? From God. Even Jesus says, you know, how much will you know, the Father give you the Holy Spirit if you ask for it? James says that God will give us wisdom if we ask for it. And Solomon says, you know, wisdom is the best thing to get. And Job is saying, even though it's the best thing to get here, we know that, it's hard to find. You're not going to find it on the earth. You're only going to find it in God. So, Job uh, 28 uh, 23 says, God understandeth the way thereof and knoweth the place thereof. And I'm going to the King James for this, okay? Usually I do in the New American Standard Bible, but here he says, For he looketh to the ends of the earth, and he seeth under the whole heaven. So here Job is saying that, you know, God isn't in the earth, he's above the earth, and that's where we get wisdom. That's, that's pretty amazing, I think. I mean, I remember, Paul says, listen, he says, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present, that's time, okay, nor things to come, that's the future, nor height nor depth, that's space, okay, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, nor any other creature is literally any other created thing. In other words, God is outside of all of that, and that is where we can go to him for ultimate wisdom and pure love. He brings that love to us through his son, Jesus Christ, right? Uh, and then finally, not finally, but in verse 25, I like this one too. He says, to make the weight for the winds, and he weigheth the waters by measure. Okay, again, this is King James. Who knew back then that air had weight? Nobody. The barometer wasn't created to, invented, not created, invented, years later, right? That measures the weight of air. 
And here, Job is saying, the wind has weight. And then he goes on to say, when he made a decree for the rain and a way for the lightning of the thunder. Wait a minute. The lightning of the thunder? I thought we see the lightning, and then we hear the thunder, right? And everybody thought, oh, the Bible got it wrong for years because we always see the lightning, and then we hear the thunder. So it seemed like the, light, the thunder came out of the lightning. That was until later on, when scientists discovered the speed of light versus the speed of sound. And yes, we see the lightning first, and then hear the thunder, but, but that's because we're a distance from it. So yeah, the lightning flashes, and we hear the thunder eventually get to us. But the point is here, Job is saying, the lightning comes from the thunder. So they happen simultaneously, basically. How did Job know that? I think only God gave it to him, right? This is how amazing the book of Job is. Uh, it gets the science right. All right, picking up now in verse, uh, or sorry, uh, Job 29 through 31, Job starts talking about his past and how wonderful he was. Okay, he basically has an eye problem. He talks about, I did this, I did that, I do this, right? Uh, in, verse, in chapter 30, Job talks about his present state, how he has lost everything and how he's despised of everybody. And then finally, in, verse, in chapter 31, rather, Job affirms his righteousness again, all right? So let's go back now and look at, a, I think it's a Job 29, 1 through 3. Yes, he's justifying himself, all right? And Job again took up his discourse and said, Oh, that I were in the months gone by, as in the days when God watched over me, when his lamps shone over my head, and by his light I walked through darkness. Now Job is thinking that God has abandoned him. Here, he says, God was with me at this point. And then he goes on to tell about how wonderful he was and how he, he basically he took care of the orphans. He never cheated anybody. He did this and did this. And, and he was basically comparing himself to other people. And Job says here in, uh, I love this because I, okay, I stole this from J. Vernon McGee, but I love this part here. He says, Job reminds me of a little tea party I heard about. I had a little tea party this afternoon at three. Twas very small, three guests in all, just I, myself, and me. Myself ate all the sandwiches while I drank up the tea. Twas also I who ate the pie and passed the cake to me. <laughs> Author unknown. Okay. <laughs> so uh, basically, Job is saying what a wonderful human being he is, right? And then he has a pity party for himself and saying that he doesn't deserve anything that's going on. And he justifies himself and he accuses God of bringing this on him for no reason. He wants to put his case to God. Well, guys, real wisdom and the correct position is to con condemn ourselves, not justify ourselves before God, right? Remember when the two people were in the temple and Jesus said, look at these two, and one was a Pharisee, and the Pharisee said, oh God, I thank myself that I'm not a sinner like this tax collector here, that I give to the poor, that I love you, and blah, 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 me, 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 look what I do, look what I do, look what I do, look what I do, right? And then he walks away. And the tax collector came prostrate and threw himself on God and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said, that man went away justified, not the Pharisee. We can only come to God through humility and through, uh, and through basically asking for forgiveness. All right? There's nothing that we can do to compare to the greatness, the majesty, and the glory of God. We can't, we can't compare ourselves to that. And Elihu gets it. Now, he's not one of three Job's three friends. At this point, I think a group of people have gathered around, and they're watching and listening to Job and the three people talk to each other. But Elihu jumps up, and he's actually the youngest one there. And in chapter 32 and 34, he speaks and he's basically upset with Job for trying to justify himself to God. And listen to what he says here in verse uh, 10 through 14 in chapter 34. Okay? He says, Therefore, listen to me, you men of understanding. 
And I think this men of understanding should be in quotes. I think he's being sarcastic because none of them helped Job and none of them really told Job what God is really like and why this is happening to him. He says, far be it from God to do wickedness and from the Almighty to do wrong. Either who gets it right, right? Surely God will not act wickedly and the Almighty will not pervert justice. Who gave him authority over the earth and who has laid on him the whole world? If he should so determine to do so, if he should gather to himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh would perish together and man would return to dust. Elihu saying, listen guys, you got it wrong. God here, there's nobody above God saying, okay God, now you're in charge of the earth. Uh-uh. <laughs> God's, there's no, no, nobody above God. God. God's the ultimate, amen? Right? And God will not act wickedly. wickedly. And he will not pervert justice. Now, our atheist friends will go back to the Old Testament and say, how could you believe in this God who would wipe out an entire tribe of people, you know, and just commit genocide? Well, okay, think of the Amorites, right? I mean, God, yeah, he said go out and wipe out all the Amorites. But we also remember that God gave the Amorites 400 years to repent, and they were doing evil constantly. And if God created the Amorites, then doesn't God have the right to take the life away from the Amorites? Right? If you create a beautiful painting, and everybody thinks, oh, wow, this painting is so wonderful, it's marvelous, you should put it in the Louvre, it's so beautiful. And you go, no, I don't like it, and you tear it up. Are you evil for doing that? No, it's your own painting, right? Now, if it's somebody else's painting, yeah then you're evil for doing that. But if it's your own painting, you've got the right to do that. Well, God has the right to take life as he wants. Now, he also has grace, amen? And he gave the Amorites incredible grace, and they didn't follow through. They had 400 years to repent. They didn't repent, and God finally says, you know, destroy them. And that's not the only tribe that, you know, the only group of people that God wanted destroyed, but that's just one example here. But God never acts wickedly, and he never perverts justice. We may not see the justice on this side of heaven, but someday, somehow, there will be a reckoning and there will be justice done for every person on earth, right? And our only plea is to plead the blood of Jesus. Right? And I love this here. Uh, where he says, if he should determine to do so, verse 14, if he should gather to himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh would perish together and man would return to dust. In other words, if God said, okay guys, you're done, and took all of our breath away at once, and we all perished instantly because God said, I'm, I'm just done with this earth, he could do that. Now, fortunately... We have a loving God that gives us second chances, amen? And he loves us so much because he created us in his image that he, according to what the Bible says, he's not going to do that. Okay, but he could. He has the right to do that because he's God. But we can, again, go and plead our case to God only through the blood of Jesus because of what Jesus did on the cross for us, right? Right? So God always does right, and he never does wrong. We were watching uh, God's Not Dead a while ago, and there's a great saying in that, in the, in, where one person says to the other one, he says, was it God is good? All the time. And all the time, God is good. God is good. Yes, right. And uh, we're going to see that when God finally comes up and starts talking to Job, although he doesn't have to, he doesn't have to, but he does. In verse 38 next week, when we, we get into that part of Job here, we're going to see what God has to say to Job and all of the wise and wonderful and beautiful words that Job says back to God. I'm being facetious, all right? He doesn't say much. We'll find that out. Anyway, let's remember, guys and gals and everybody out there, that God loves you. God loves me. He loves you. He loves everybody. And he wants us to have the right relationship with him through his son, Jesus Christ.
So we're going we're gonna to pray, and then we're going to sing uh, Indescribable from Chris Tomlin there. Because Chris Tomlin get, talks about nature, but then he talks about Jesus Christ in that song too. Father, we thank you today, Lord, for your goodness, your graciousness, and your gospel, Lord. Thank you that we can join together, Lord, and praise your name. Thank you, Lord, that you've given us wisdom through uh, the book of Job and also through the entire Bible. We ask, Lord, that as we continue to study your word, that we're drawn closer to you and that you would allow us to bring others into your kingdom through the knowledge and the wisdom you give us to share your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Let's.